This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the Southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. What is happening, friends? So good to see you again. Uh, even though technically we really can't see you, but we know you're there. <laughs> he is Kenny, I'm Ray, and as always, we have got one heck of a show for you. That we do. Coming up, supply chains and shipping, they're a major concern for both consumers and farmers, and although it's difficult to untangle, we'll break down how global bottlenecks are impacting the economy. Also, an interesting perspective on how food is one of the reasons for the war in Ukraine. U.S. Secretary of Ag Tom Vilsack shares his thoughts on the conflict and the important message he has for the people here in the United States. Speaking of food, Damon Jones with the story of one healthcare organization that is using food as medicine, a food pharmacy spelled with an F. Best of all, it's available to anyone who has a medical condition where nutrition can benefit their health. Ready or not, the Farm Monitor starts right now. Make no mistake about it, the current supply chain crisis is a major concern for consumers and just about every business sector of the world, including agriculture. But when and where did it all go sideways? And will it ever correct itself? American Farm Bureau Chief Economist Dr. Roger Cryan points to COVID-19 and says issues began when the virus shut down dining and entertainment and changed consumer spending habits. All our demand shifted to stuff, and that demand for a lot of stuff clogged up ocean shipping, which we're still dealing with. That's created problems at the ports, shortages of, of containers, and our ag exporters have had a hard time moving product back across to Asia. And our farmers have had a hard time getting inputs, and our equipment manufacturers have had a hard time getting inputs. And there's all kinds of things that are hard to get. Again, we've pumped up the economy so much, pumped up demand so much that it's going to take time for supply to catch up, and that's going to take time and investment. Congress passed an infrastructure bill that should help the U.S. check off a lot of those overdue projects that will help the economy grow. The economy cooling off a little bit will be important to really getting things sort of straight again. Like most economists, Cryan's advice, hold steadfast and remain patient, adding it's unfortunate that some of these supply chain issues will be around for a while. Easier said than done because those ongoing issues are also impacting inflation. Well, inflation is too much money chasing too little supply. The economy is running hot again. There's a lot of demand given the scale of the oversupply of money right now. The only practical solution for inflation is for the Federal Reserve Bank to rein in their lending. Ray, thanks so much. In other global news, the message from U.S. Secretary of Ag Tom Vilsack. Appreciate the important role food and agriculture plays in your future. While speaking at the National 4-H Conference recently, Vilsack said the U.S. has a strong, stable democracy because it's capable of feeding itself. Quote, show me a nation that doesn't feed its people, and I'll show you a nation that's looking to try to expand its borders. End quote. Vilsack went on to say that he believes food is one of the keys to what's happening now to the people of Ukraine. One of the reasons that they're now engaged in this struggle for their democracy and their independence is because they are an extraordinary breadbasket as well. They can expand significantly the capacity of Russia to feed itself. And make no mistake about it, food is part of the equation here. With food insecurity being a major obstacle around central and south Georgia, a unique approach to providing access to both nutritious food and dietary information is now being taken in Bibb County. Damon Jones visited the new Food as Medicine and Food Pharmacy program and has their story. Thanks to a collaboration between local food banks and Atrium Health Navicent, the Food as Medicine market is now open to the public in Macon, where visitors have complete control over what foods will go on their dinner table. Our uh, residents here in Macon and our surrounding areas can come get a shopping cart, walk around and pick the food that they want. Um, and then we will uh, provide some education and get them heading in the good direction with their wellness and health. There are two major calls. One was access to healthy foods, and then the second call was more knowledge about those healthy foods. So the food as medicine market responded to both of those needs. 
With heart disease being the number one cause of death in the U.S., getting this information out can result in countless lives being saved in the future. That's why the center's food pharmacy program is a vital part to the health of the community. The reason why we're specialized is we also do education around just general nutrition, um, what's best to eat. We teach kind of how to turn the can around and look at the labels and read that. In the food pharmacy, we work with uh, local physicians um, who can refer patients that may need um, more education specifically around diseases such as heart failure and diabetes. It's not just information, but also solutions this program offers, which is a valuable tool for both the participants and medical professionals. As a physician, this program provides us with resources that we never had before. Um, previously, we used to only be able to refer patients to programs that would have a long wait list. They would have to wait for months before they can access healthy, nutritious foods. But the Food as Medicine program and the Food Pharmacy program provides them with timely access to healthy options, but also that one-on-one -on -one mentoring, which is so unique. One of the common misconceptions about eating healthy is that it's prohibitively expensive for many. However, all that's really needed is a little bit of education. Eating healthy can be very affordable. Um, you just have to know what healthy options exist in your community. And that is what the Food as Medicine program and Food Pharmacy program does. Um, it helps educate the community patrons about what's healthy and what's cost effective and how you can do so to not only feed yourself, but also a large family should you have one or even a small family. With this being such a big need, especially in food deserts, they hope this is just the first step in a long process. We would like to expand into Peach County and Baldwin County, where we also have um, hospitals in other areas. Um, we, our classes will be starting up next year, so we will be doing a lot of um, group educational programs. And who knows from there, we'll, we have a lot of other exciting um, things to come. Reporting from Bibb County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Well, buckle your seatbelts and grab you a handful of delicious and nutritious Georgia peanuts. After the break, we're living life in the fast lane and telling you all about the unique partnership involving the Georgia Peanut Commission. Across the USA, farmers are discovering the benefits of high tunnel systems. And the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service can help with both technical and financial assistance to integrate high tunnels into your farming operation. While they may look like greenhouses, high tunnels are actually quite different. Greenhouses are usually constructed of glass and metal with seeds or plants grown in pots. High tunnels are polyethylene, plastic, or fabric enclosed structures built over hoops, and they can be assembled for a fraction of the cost. Because of their lightweight modular construction, high tunnels are easy to assemble and often easy to move. This benefits a variety of crops, from plants to trees, growing directly in the ground or in raised beds. Having greater climate control allows farmers to improve plant health and vigor. They can protect their crops from weather extremes, poor air quality, wind, and other damaging effects. They can also grow crops earlier in the spring and later into the winter months, and sometimes year-round. And they offer farmers a greater ability to manage pests and even drift from pesticides and pollen. Because these environments prevent direct rainfall from reaching plants, farmers can use precision tools like drip irrigation to efficiently deliver both water and nutrients. High tunnels can also provide farmers with a number of ways to improve soil health, including the use of cover crops as part of their crop rotation practice. This can help prevent erosion, suppress weeds, increase soil water content, and break pest cycles. 
and their continuing effort to help improve the effectiveness of high tunnels. NRCS also supports scientists unlocking the secrets of cover crops, using laboratory testing to reveal even greater soil fertility benefits. But perhaps the best thing about high tunnels is that they help farmers furnish their communities with more diverse local crops, reducing energy and transportation costs and providing their communities with greater food security. To learn more about NRCS assistance with high tunnels, visit your local NRCS field office or nrcs.usda.gov. NRCS, helping you help the land. Believe it or not, work on the 2023 Farm Bill has already started. Reese Langley, Vice President of Washington Operations for the National Cotton Council, says right now discussions are mainly focused on the economic environment producers are facing and whether the current Farm Bill safety net is designed and capable to respond as necessary. Obviously, many commodities, including cotton, are experiencing a strong market today. But at the same time, they're seeing their major inputs increase in price and cost. Almost across the board, all of their production costs are increasing. One of the things was in the next farm bill, does it need to take more of a focus on protecting the margin for producers and not strictly be based on price support or revenue support levels? Georgia peanut farmers feel proud. Your delicious product is once again being showcased in front of millions of racing fans. It's a partnership the Georgia Peanut Commission has been doing for over a decade now to help bring awareness to Georgia's peanut industry. But as John Holcomb reports, this year they went a step further and decided to go full speed towards that checkered flag. NASCAR fans are no doubt just fans. They're fanatics. And those that attended the race in Atlanta got the chance to taste and see Georgia peanuts on display as the Georgia Peanut Commission partnered with the Atlanta Motor Speedway to showcase the Georgia peanut industry to millions of NASCAR fans both in person and on national television. We consider this a wonderful opportunity to meet the fans that are coming in and introduce them to peanuts or help promote peanuts and those sort of things. So we're really proud of the peanut packs and the red ones that we give out out here and uh, a lot of folks are coming by. We do have some cans that are in the uh, booths inside, so the fans inside that are in those booths will get a chance to sample some of the Georgia peanuts. This year, the commission also sponsored the number 38 car for the Atlanta and Talladega races driven by Todd Gilliland, a rookie who's excited to be racing in the NASCAR Cup Series this year and says that he's proud to be sporting the Georgia peanuts logo. It's always awesome to go to the racetrack and be able to represent you know, a group of people in a brand uh, like Georgia Peanuts. It's, it's hardworking people. Um, you know, I feel like we have a lot of hardworking people on our team. So I feel like a lot of our, um, a lot of what we do kind of aligns. And uh, you know, like I said, that's the main thing is just hopefully represent them well and um, you know, really get their name out there and, and promote the hard work. Gilliland says that the partnership has been extra special to him as it's given him the chance to appreciate the Georgia peanut industry and the hard work that Georgia peanut farmers do each and every day. Having Georgia peanuts as a sponsor has helped me realize, you know, agriculture is so important to, to everything we do, like you said. So I think a lot of, a lot of people don't even realize that. So uh, hopefully that's one thing we can get out is, uh, you know, how important all this stuff is. And, um, you know, honestly, I didn't realize that the majority of peanuts in the United States, I think, comes from the state of Georgia and um, you know, from Georgia peanuts. So uh, it's been really cool to see all the products that they're used in. And uh, I honestly didn't know the, uh, the magnitude of, uh, of what they're doing. I know a lot of people that have grown up in the agriculture industry, but that really was never me growing up. Uh, you know, I didn't really know too much about it. So it's always really cool to learn what other people do. Um, you know, it's, it's always better the, the more you can learn about life and um, you know, a, lot, uh, a lot comes from these guys. This year was also a special one for Georgia Peanuts because it was the 25th anniversary of when the Georgia Peanuts sponsored a car, one on the Atlanta Motor Speedway track that had just been repaved. And they were no doubt hoping for a repeat outcome this year. If we go back 25 years on this racetrack, when it was freshly resurfaced, a peanut farmer from Cuthbert, Georgia by the name of Harris Devane won the ARCA race. Last race of the season that year, and it was a proud moment for him and for Georgia Peanuts, and the Georgia Peanut Commission did sponsor him then, and his car is right over here today being exhibited. 
Unfortunately, though, they didn't get the outcome they were hoping for. Late in the race, Gilland was involved in a crash and was unable to finish. Reporting in Hampton for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. Well, it's back. The GFB Certified Farm Markets Passport Program. Sure, it's great for checking out local farms and agritourism spots, but it can also lead to two people saying, I do, and living happily ever after. That's next when we come back. Automation has been integrated into almost all aspects of our lives, and dairy farms are no different. In the last five to ten years, there's been a huge increase in farmers adopting automated milking systems, says Courtney Halbach, an outreach specialist with the Dairyland Initiative. Part of the reasons behind that is because they want to improve labor efficiency um, as well as milk production. So we've gone and visited 42 herds throughout the Midwest, and we focused on the facility design of these robot herds as well as labor efficiency. And what we oftentimes forget is that now we're managing the cow differently in an AMS unit versus a cow in a pen that leaves to go to be milked. The differences begin at the ground level. Hallbach says while freestall dimensions and widths can remain the same, cows will require more room to move about to access the robot. It can be as simple as widening alleys by about two feet. So cows have um, an easier time moving throughout the different areas of the pen. Maybe it's from the resting space to the feed space to the robot. We also want to make sure that there's plenty of space around the robot areas so that there's limited congestion and cows aren't having to wait to access the robot. The flow of cow movement throughout the barn is really important and it'll require some patience while cows get familiar with their new routine. Typically we advocate for about 55 cows per robot. That allows for cows to have enough time to be milked and access the robot, limits overcrowding in the pen, and we see that this is an easier amount of cows to handle for a person per a robot. Where gates are located throughout the barn is an important consideration too for planning the fastest route for the herd manager or employees to get to cows as quickly and easily as possible. Gating, although it costs a lot up front and it's not something you would think of right away, is something that's super important in improving labor efficiency down through the lifetime of the robot. As more dairy producers adopt robotic milking systems, they're learning which cows perform best in the new facilities. Hallbach says genetics are increasingly important in robotic herds, with the U.S. registered Holsteins leading the way. Holstein can be there to help make sure that these cows are ready for the robot. So maybe it's udder confirmation, legs, teat placement, how much milk um, outflow there is and the quality of the milk. So um, cows are different for either a conventional milking herd or a robot herd and that's where Holstein can come in with genetics and those resources to make sure that you have the right cows for the milking system on your farm. One tool offered by Holstein Association USA to benefit robotic herds is TriStar AMR which allows production data gathered by robotic milking systems to be collected into the Holstein herd book and published on official Holstein pedigrees. Learn more at HolsteinUSA.com. For Holstein Association USA, I'm Bob Cervera. Well, finally this week, it's back, and some would say it's now better than ever. Yes, the it my friend here is referring to, the widely popular Georgia Farm Bureau Passport Program, which features over 90 farms in GFB Certified Farm Markets Program. As you visit the farms, they stamp your passport. The more stamps you receive, the more prizes you will earn. Last year, a first in the program's short history, three couples, somehow, some way, able to visit every single one of the CFMs. And that, my friends, is no easy task. How did they do it, why did they do it, and what were some of their favorite spots to visit? Just a few of the questions we addressed when I spoke to each winner.
let me start by asking you this, Gene, David. Um, what actually attracted you to the Passport program? Not only are we learning something that we didn't know anything about, but it's like hooking up with these people that have become friends and getting to see them, you know, each year. Can't wait to see them again. Mm -hmm. Some of these people, I have to tell you, uh, um, they go out of their way to give us a passport stamp. Ronald, Charlotte, uh, next question for you. Um, what about a specific method? I know when I've talked to people about this in the past, you know, some people have punched in, you know, GPS coordinates. They've got the whole list. Okay, we're doing this. We're going to go down this, this side of the state, then go back over. Did you guys, was there a method to your madness or was it just like, close your eyes, hey, this is where we're going this weekend? Some farms that were only open one month out of the year and then others were, and they weren't in the order that they were open. And so I was like, oh, there's no way we'll make all of them if we don't make some kind of plan. So I made a spreadsheet. I spent my evenings off work in the evenings. I would pull up the internet, see what was open, ask Robert where we wanted to go. And, you know, I had to, we had to plan it throughout the whole year. What, what drives people, you think? Several reasons. Um, being competitive and then also discovering new places within Georgia and meeting new people. And how about this little twist? This little book here enabled one couple to discover each other right here at Fitzgerald Fruit Farms in Woodbury. Uh, well, I parked over there, she parked over there, and we met right right where you're at, actually, in, in the gravel. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the normal, a little bit nervous, uh, she was cuter in person, um, which was uh, definitely nice. And <laughs> it was good, a good conversation. Uh, and she was genuine, and it's fun to sit down and talk to. He had asked me about if there was a winery close by, and I've been here at Fitzgerald Farms before. And so I was like, well, let's just uh, meet here. And then, you know, he can check out the farm too. And it just kind of worked out. It certainly did. That first date resulted in more dates and even more trips to farm markets using the passport as their personal tour guide. And wouldn't you know it, a year after that first encounter at Fitzgerald Fruit Farm, Nathaniel and Virginia were back at the farm, this time with Nathaniel dropping to one knee and popping the question. It was funny. They were they were short staffed that day, like everybody was, you know, during COVID. And so the, the wine tasting was taking a good amount of time. I had this huge box in my back pocket. I'm trying to hide from her while we're and she's getting up and walking around. And I'm having to turn and make sure she can't see behind me because you can't miss this huge thing in my back pocket hiding. It was a, it, a long wine tasting. It was a long wine tasting <laughs> waiting to get out here in the porch so we could so I could finally just get it out and get it over with. <laughs> Have you had other engagements here? Oh yes, we've had multiple engagements. We've helped people celebrate milestone anniversaries, some 50th anniversaries. We've even hosted a couple of small weddings. And so I think the, the Passport program has just made it so clear to people how many farms um, are so close to them. We have people that'll bring the, the book up and say, okay, what other farms are close by here? We're trying to hit three or four in a day. Which ones would you recommend? So it's a way for farms to promote each other. Um, it brings brand new faces in, um, it develops that sense of family that we have with most of our customers. So the program's been great. Oh, such a cute love story. Hey, before we send you on your way, a friendly reminder that for all the latest ag news regarding food, recipes, and what's happening on Georgia Farms, be sure you check out all of our social media platforms, including farm-monitor.com. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and have a great week.